Good morning. So a couple of, of announcements this morning. Uh, first is the uh, Thanksgiving, community Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, if you would, everyone, please read through this yellow insert in your bulletin. Um, it, it gives a description on the front of what the community Thanksgiving dinner is. And then, and then on the back, um, it gives items that is needed. Uh, so if you, you know, there's like uh, gallon bags of celery, onions and cornbread, uh, uh, turkeys, cooked turkeys, uh, and then desserts. And then you can also sponsor plates. Uh, we are needing uh, more turkeys. So uh, if you're willing to uh, go buy a turkey and cook it uh, for the Thanksgiving meal, uh, please sign, sign up on these sheets and uh, put them in the offering plate or give them to uh, Catherine or Lindy and, uh, and they'll get these turned in. So, so please read through this yellow insert uh, this morning uh, because uh, it's, it's getting near. Also, uh, the decorating the church uh, for Advent will be November the 28th and 29th at 9 a.m. and uh, we're needing all the volunteers that we can we can get to come out uh, the more volunteers we have then uh, the quicker it goes uh, so please mark that down in your calendars uh, to come help uh, decorate the church uh, and get it ready for Advent. Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you with us today to know this is the day our Lord has made. And we can do what? We can rejoice and? Are you glad to be here? Are you glad to be here? Oh, yeah, come on. You get to see my smiling face. Yeah. Better than that, you get to see the smiling face of Jesus Christ upon each of your brothers and sisters' heart today as we worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's the most exciting time we can have. Let's begin our worship service this day as we bow just a few moments in silence to give our thanks and praise and center ourselves upon God's mercy and grace. Will you? And now, Almighty God, we ask that you'll send the light of your Son into our lives anew today. We pray that your presence will touch our hearts and our minds with your mercy, grace, and truth. So we pray again, Holy Spirit, would you just fall fresh upon us and empower our worship this day. In Christ I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our opening worship songs in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see and when I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family, I can hear the rain reminding me. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of the war You guard my soul You alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me
not one of us here today know that sometimes we go through struggles, be it our health, our relationships, and sometimes just seems as though the wheels fall apart. We have ladies who come together on each Tuesday morning through the work of their hands. They take the opportunity to, well, out of their beauty, they create each one of these shawls that are sitting before me. These shawls will represent God's grace, God's healing, and God's mercy as we present to those individuals who may need a time of prayer. Every one of these in themselves are finished, but I like the one that's still yet to be done. No, there's a reason, I think. You see, God's grace doesn't stop with just one shawl, but it's perpetuated as they continue to take their hands and knit and as it touches each person's lives, it'll make a world of a difference. If you're part of that knitting club this morning, would you just stand? I just wanna say thank you. Would you stand? Yeah. 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 So as we normally do this day, we we wanna take an, an opportunity just to lay our hands on each of these and we'll pray that those who wear these around their shoulders will experience God's mercy, grace, and healing. Will you come? You know, God, well, we know that you are always present in our lives and that your love transcends all tragedy, illnesses, and pains. We also know that sometimes a physical reminder can just bring us hope, healing, and peace especially to someone in need or crying out. We ask that you will bless these shawls and those who will receive them. May they see the intricate love and care given to each one of these, mirroring the intricate love and care that God, you bestow upon all of us. May they who feel the warmth and breath of your Holy Spirit as it wraps them May they feel comfort in knowing that someone has prayed for them as they has pieced it together and as we have laid our hands upon it. May they feel the power of our prayers and as they feel the yarn winding through their fingers, may they know that you're near. May they feel touched by our loved, moved by our guidance, <clears throat> held up by your support through the presence of your spirit. So we pray together and ask that God that you will open our eyes, all of us, that we may see those who are hurting. Open our ears so that we might respond with open hearts and open minds. So that those who are in need of healing and power in your presence, not only send these shawls, but send us. Open our hearts so that we can reach out and make a difference. For each of us today, we pray this in Jesus, our Lord and Savior's name, as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I encourage you, if you do know someone that is in need of prayer and someone who's in need of the presence of the Spirit, you can contact me or one of these ladies and we will see that you, that you have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. All of the white ones are for babies and children. Please be, feel free to contact any of us anytime you want one of these shawls or blankets for a child in your family or a child that you know or a newborn baby. Uh, we've just kind of started this and added to it recently. The yellow ones are designated for our new Grace House ladies, and the pink ones are for breast cancer. 
So please feel free and also feel free to come and join us on Tuesday mornings. We knit, we do all kinds of needlework and we visit. And on the third Tuesday, we go to Central City and have coffee and knit and they take good, good care of us. We would love to have you if you'd like to come. If you don't know how to do needlework, we also will teach you, ha ha. So <laughs> hopefully, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Sandy. Allow us to continue to worship and praise our God through that of the hymn 154, all power, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Would you stand? Let us pray. Lord God, we just thank you for this day and thank you for everyone that has come out today to worship you. Now, Lord, we just ask for your presence to fall on this place. Be with the pastor as he gives his message today. And Lord, we just ask for your blessings upon these tithes and offerings in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. Um, our acolytes do a great job, don't they? Do you all know what acolytes do? Okay. Well, they come in on Sunday mornings and they get the candles lit for us. But there's a more important job that they actually do. Chris, I was doing the math yesterday and it was about 20 years ago when Kristen and Catherine started acolyting. And then when they retired, Caitlin and Lauren took over. So we, we have acolytes in our family too. But the main purpose of the acolytes is to light the candles, but it's more than that. The word acolyte comes from a Greek word that means followers, helpers, or assistants. Since ancient times, light and fire have reminded people that God is here with us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. The presence of the light reminds us that Jesus, is coming into our, that Jesus is coming into our lives. The light is carried into the sanctuary as a symbol of Jesus coming into the presence of the worship service. And the light stays with us during the service. When the acolytes carry the flame out of the sanctuary at the end of the service, they're reminding the worshipers that God remains with us in all places at all times. We take God's light with us when we leave the church and it stays with us during the week ahead. So what are some of the ways that we can let our shine, our light shine during the week ahead? Can you all think of some ways that we can, when we take the light back out into the world, what are some ways that we can let our light shine? Can you all think of any ways? What are some ways that we can what are some things that we can do to show people that we have Jesus in our heart? Do you think of anything? Yes. Go to church. Okay, we can come to church, exactly. What else? Um, on my dad's class, um, get him a new car. You can get your dad a new car? Wow. You, <laughs> you what? Oh, yes, I heard about that. I'm so, I'm so thankful he's okay. I heard about his wreck this week. But yes, you're a great son. Give thanks to God. Give thanks to God. You're exactly right. Yes. Pray for God. Oh, okay. That's a great one too. So some other things we can do, we can help those in need. If you see someone that needs help, you can help them out a little bit. You can be kind, and you know, it's, it's easy being kind to people that are kind to us, isn't it? But is it so easy to be kind to people who are unkind to us? No, it's not. But sometimes we can let our light shine if we're kind to them, because they may just be having a bad day. And we can let our, shine, let our light shine just by smiling, smiling at somebody, especially if they have a frown on their face. Just give them a great big smile, and maybe they'll turn that frown upside down. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us this week and let our light shine and be witnesses to others. Amen. You all stand again, please. <laughs> Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won Still in you. 
Good morning, good morning. We've had a rash of sickness run through the choir, so now it's Ron Dockery that's sick, as well as Sarah Carey is still sick. So Sarah's solo will be done by Connie Thompson this morning, and Ron's solo is going to be done by all of the guys. So you all pray for this choir.
If you will with me, would you stand as we read God's holy word this day, found within Esther chapter 5, verse 14. His wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said to him, Have a post set up, reaching to a height of 50 cubits, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The book of Esther is a small little book found in the Old Testament. I think, what, nine chapters long, maybe? Uh, But within it, it is helping us to see that once again, um, a whole group of people by the name of Jews are in the midst of a possibility of a genocide, a total removal from the land of Persia. It's written probably about the fifth century, and it is here that you have a very prideful and lustful king by the name of Xerxes. He's even so proud and vain that he's having a great banquet for everyone in his community. He's so prideful of his wife. He, she, he wants her to come in and basically um, do a horrible dance in front of everyone there. And she chooses not to. Needs to say upon that, she immediately is fired, divorced, and kicked out. So the king Xerxes is going to find himself another, another bride. So he pulls together all the beautiful women in the community and he begins to pull looking at each one of them, who would be the best his spouse. Number one came to be is Esther. And Esther herself was an orphaned. Her parents had p- passed. Mordecai was her, was her cousin. And Mordecai took care of this very beautiful child, his cousin. Now, they had not in any way t- told this king that they were Jews. They kept that to themselves. Kept that to themselves. Even to the fact of, of Mordecai, found out there's be a plot against King Xerxes and let them to be known, and he built up some brownie points. But there was other man by the name of uh, Haman. Uh, Haman. Haman was just, he's just evil, that's all I can say. Haman was filled with so much vanity that he wanted none other than Mordecai when he came to the city gates. He needed to bow down, curts, curtsy me. Haman said, I'm not going to do that at all. Not going to happen. He became angry. Haman did, and he went to the king and said to the king, after much, uh, um, I don't know, played up to his, his uh, prideful way of being, and he wanted him, Mordecai, killed, and eventually all of his people killed. Now, you've got to ask yourself, Mordecai, wouldn't it have been just easier just to bow down and placate yourself before him? Wouldn't it have been easier? Wouldn't it have been easier? And yet, if we're not careful in the world we live in, it's a whole lot easier just to placate to the world than just to fight the atrocities of it. So I think for a moment, then, here is himself, Mordecai, standing strong. Haman can't stand it. Haman, therefore, decides he's going to put a pole together based upon his wife's counsel and put it up 50 cubits long. Well, unbeknown to him, Mordecai and, and uh, Esther had had a conversation. Mordecai basically said, Esther, you need to do something. If you don't, God's going to do it regardless. And so they're going to set up two banquets. The king allowed her to do so. The first banquet, they had a great time together. They got drunk. They went home. And Esther said, but I want another one. And this time in the process, but I want you to do this. And she found favor with the king. And I, I, want, I want Haman to, to march Mordecai, the person who plotted against and found the plot against you. And you can imagine how Haman felt. He wanted to have him killed. And now he has to march him through the town. Makes him feel real good. After the second banquet, however, his evil plot was found out. And the very gallows, the very pole by which Mordecai was to be hung on, Haman was. Now, I say that to you because clearly in the world we live in, there are just pure evil, right? There are people there who who, who only desire is to hurt other people. An evil person can push back against the painful consequences of their choices and decisions so that in in doing so, 
They take the pain of their mistakes and multiply it. And if not careful being optimistic people or people who put our heads in the sand and watching CNN, um, Fox, CBS, NBC, did I miss any of them? As we listen and hear all the time the evil that the world is coming in, we get to the point, throw up our hands, eyes, and it can't make a difference, so we basically stick our hands in the sand. But listen, sometimes, 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 no, I'd rather say all the time, we must stand up and make a difference to those who are pointing the fingers, saying to us, I'll bring this place down. There's evil people and systems all around us. I don't have to go far. 2000, I was able to fly to Israel. Beautiful country. Call it the fifth gospel. Seen all the places Jesus had walked. Went there to the possibility of where he was crucified. And there his body was laid. Where he was born. Powerful experience. And then towards the end of it, we were allowed to go to the Holocaust Museum there in. Now, I always heard about it read about it, but until I walked into that museum and actually began to to see the items, the clothing, and to read the the stories, and my heart was broken. I couldn't even finish the tour. I had to go. I, I I was weeping bitterly. It's painful. Painful. And I think for the moment, I wish that such evil would have stopped Yet, we know today that genocide is still going on in the 21st century. Rwanda, Defar, Serbia, Syria, South Sudan, you can name others. It's happening all around us still. We have evil people and evil systems, and we often equate that as being outside the United States. But I don't have to look very far within our own selves, and I can see it here as well. I look and see the white supremacists that have begun to rise once again. And their basic model is clearly we must secure the existence of our people and a future for our white children. There have been supremacist movements such as the neo-Nazis, the skinheads, racist skinheads, traditional white supremacists, Christian identity adherents, West Barrel Baptist Church, by the way, no affiliation with the Southern Baptist. And white supremacist prison gains. It's even now become an intellectual supremacist to provide an intellectual veneer or justification for the white supremacist concepts in today. Yeah, we've had evil people and evil systems. When I think in 19, excuse me, in 2018, there was 340 U.S. mass shootings. 1,346 injuries and 373 deaths. As of September 21st, 2019, there's been 334, excuse me, 335 based on the Santa Clara. Mass shooting occurred, has already occurred. That's an average of almost 1.2 mass shootings per day. And in these shootings, 1,347 people injured and 377 or now 379 have died died even today we've been asked the number one fear of most of our kids clearly is a a gunman's going to walk in and shoot them and teachers having to run the drills and the horrificness before school even starts of mass shootings taking place and we think i didn't grow up like this did you Evil systems and evil people are among us and we can keep our heads in the sand and say nothing's happening or we can do something about it. But at times it seems almost a hopeless situation that we can't stop the fury nor the pain. A recent Barna survey showed to us that, that within the society we live in now based upon the elders or the silence, the boomers, the Gen Xs, the millennials and Gen Zs and there's another one after that one. But nonetheless, of those in world of these generations, they're becoming more agnostic. In other words, God created and pulled back, simplistic view of it. And atheists to believe in no God whatsoever. And that number continues to rise. And we have to ask ourselves, why? And then I see the next statistics he he begins to share, the Barna group. When we look at the Gen X's and the Gen Z's, 
They themselves have a, have a hard time believing that a good God would allow so much evil or suffering in the world. And that's only going to continue to increase. So the question is, what do we do? How do we respond? How do we stop the mass shootings? And how do we defer the evil within the world around us? And some say you can't. And on one level, I will agree with you. You can take out all the Osama bin Ladens and all the evil structures. There's still going to be evil, homicidal people in the world because evil is here. The adversary is among us. But listen, each of those persons started out, I don't think started off by saying, I'm going to go shoot someone. I'm going to kill every person in society. It had to have happened over, I would believe, over time, unless you were raised specifically in that type of attitude. And listen, that's just not in the Middle East. These white supremacists are raising their children in the same hatred mode as those in the Middle East. It, it, it's done no difference. So what do we do? Well, I'm reminded it within the, the early Christian faith. They too was horribly persecuted. We don't have to look very far in Rome. The first persecutions, the massive persecutions broke out by none other than, than of, of Nero himself who were horrible with it. Lighting Christians and placing them on a pole so that they themselves would become torches into, to, to none other than Rome. He, he, he lit the entire city of Roman fire and then blamed it on the Christians. So what do we do? Well, I think first and foremost things we have to begin to lose is say these words. What does a follower of Jesus do in atrocious evils? You say, I can't do anything on the world plane. But listen, you can do things here on the personal level of your lives. I think the first thing that we can begin to see in revenge is to resist revenge. Resist revenge. I heard about the guy that went to the, his doctor and Doctor diagnosed him with having rabies and it was going to take him uh, several series of, of injections to get over it. And he said, we need to begin it, to do it immediately. And the man clearly says, no, I don't want to start them now. There's a few people that I want to go and bite. Vengefulness. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Heard that? People therefore harbor it with inside of them and when they're no longer looking, then they bring it out in the most powerful piece that you can imagine, revenge. Yet I think today we don't want just somewhere in the future. Today we almost happens today. We get hit, so we hit. Literally and figuratively. I've got one sitting in the congregation this morning who found themselves at a horrific event, beaten, hit, broad daylight, Louisville. Thank God you're okay. Evil is with us and all around us. Seeking revenge will get us nowhere. And you say, well, I'm not seeking revenge, but we do so in our bigotry attitudes. We do that in our racist, and we do it in our anti, 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 anti. And we still in that ugliness. Jesus, though, gives us a true and understanding. He says to them, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Yeah, I like that part, don't you? If you're not careful... That becomes a vengeful attitude. But rather what he's saying here is do good to those who don't, we feel, deserve good. Do those who slander us. Do those who kind to us and hurt us. Our politicians need to hear this and hear it well. Our leaders of the day need to hear these words. And just because I got dirt on you doesn't mean I have to share that dirt. And we do it on a daily basis if we're not careful. In our offices in our jobs, in our churches. Seek not revenge. 
Revenge does nothing but keep things in evil circulations. How do you begin to keep that from happening? First and foremost, how many of you are without sin? Raise your first hand. Everyone here is therefore sinful. Therefore, I think there is evil within us. People, evil? Yeah, there's evil within us because sin is evil and anyone who does sin is evil. I'm not saying that you are evil. I'm just saying there's evil within you. And our responsibility as a Christian faith is to be able to get the hell out of you and put the heaven in you. That's what the Apostle Paul calls sanctification, moving us from one place to the other. So the way we think and the way we respond to the world is different because we have a different way of seeing things. We're not gonna seek revenge. We're gonna be kind and gracious. So the guy who just pulled in front of us and therefore cut us off, we're not gonna pass him and then slow down. None of you have done that either, have you? And heaven forbid they fly the American flag at you and not the literal one, the American salute. Be careful not falling the same pieces. Don't look at me. I know I'm guilty, Nancy. She's had to calm me down more than once. And she's still trying to pray the literal hell out of me and put the heaven in me. I'm just as much a part of this. But until I can work on myself and let the sanctifying grace of God to remove the evilness within me, and that takes a daily battle, a constant battle to keep my thoughts pure and upon that which is Christ. It's a daily battle. But what I don't have to do by myself if I've got other brothers and sisters walking alongside of me. I don't have to worry about it. I know that I mess up and I know that I have caused problems. So I got a group of pastors we meet once a month and we confess our sins to one another knowing that there's evil within us and we're not leading the way we're supposed to because we ourselves are sinners. Saved by grace, lest we boast. In our personal lives, we have to ask if the evil's within us and we yet not arrive to perfection that God has asked us to, then if you're not a part of a group that will hold you accountable, I think that's where it begins. It's easy to say, I have this fault and I have this fault. Well, great, I'm glad you do it. That's the first piece of it. The second piece is, now what are you gonna do about it? And who's gonna hold you accountable to see that it's done and changed? Or the attitude of revenge will continue and other attitudes will maintain itself. Then we move to the fact of, so what do we do about it? Well, that comes back to what I've been speaking of. A follower does good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. William L. Watt, uh, you've heard that uh, to overcome darkness, you light a candle. Have you heard that saying before? Well, I went back and tried to research as to where that began. Some say it's a Chinese proverbs, but this is what I know in the early writings of, of, of that in 1907, this Methodist pastor from England wrote this uh, sermon entitled The Invincible Strategy. He said, evil is not overcome by denunciation. And in other words, talking about it or shout about it. But, but this denunciation rhetoric, rhetoric is so much easier and cheaper than good works and proves a popular temptation. Yet it's far better to light the candle than curse the darkness. What this world awaits is a personal, positive, constructive goodness. Not by law, legislation, or rhetoric shall we prevail, but by the practical righteousness, notable philanthropy, intellectual and spiritual education, by the positive remedy of superior character, actions, and institutions, do we make it difficult for evil to survive. Lighting a candle or curse the darkness. You've heard it said that you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father in heaven. Can I say not all evil is violent? Not all evil results of somebody knocking you out or causing you physical pain. Some of the evil we live in today is one by which words actually do harm and cause problems. It's a world in which we live in today and it's been more my heart broken when I hear the number of our children in elementary schools who find themselves have, either, have been sexually abused or molested by somebody whom they know have been taken out of their homes. 
to hear that moms and dads no longer have custody of the children because of their perpetual use of drugs and other pieces. And I know it's so easy for us to say simple, they just need to clean their act up and just quit and act right. Sounds good. But it don't always work. It isn't working. So what do we do? Here's what I do know. What we found out is these, is that every child is just one caring adult away from being a success story. Now, we need to do things for the adults, but if we don't start with the children who are learning new behaviors, then it's only going to perpetuate itself, and we must begin to do so in a way that's powerfully motivated we also know that if a child is not able to read a third grade level by the time he graduates, his propensity or her propensity for doing drugs, alcohol, and finding themselves incarcerated is far greater than anything before by just teaching a child to read at a third grade level. Getting back to the mass shootings that we take in place. The number one reason they have found is to many of those as to why they're taking place, not because of the guns, but because most of them have had a horrific event as a child based upon abuse of some level and out of that it just continues to bubble up within them and finally it explodes our children of today is just one caring adult away from being a success story so how do we do that I have likened and heard these and I love it within our county is what I am hearing teachers do is silent mentoring what is that the faculty comes together and they see those, per, those kids. Let's face it, they know who they are. They're defiant. They can't sit in classes. They're always in troubles and troublemakers. And they've begun to, to name these persons. And silently, the teachers are mentoring them from afar. How's your day? What can I do to help? How's your classes and so forth? Building, building relationship with them. Create an opportunity that they can see that someone cares because they're only one adult relationship from a successful life. Another way I see that is happening within this congregation is some of you are part of the reading program of our elementary schools. Amen, thank you for doing that. Sitting and spending time, 10 minutes, mentoring programs. Not only that, there's, there's the ability today to have foster care in our homes most foster care children aren't there by choice but because of the horrible at times of the places they find themselves in as foster care they continue to find another one and another one and another one to the point they're going to become in many cases how often can I find a new one and it becomes a game among those in foster care <laughs> the United Methodist Children's Home with that of Julie Hager Love just speaking with us talks about these things that's happening in our world today in the state of Kentucky. And she talks about the fact that they're now taking, not just bringing children in as, as, as an orphanage home, beginning to work with systems, social workers in their community to try to find a better place for these kids and working it into a family systems or creating family systems that will help. Am I making sense? Because if we're going to change the world within us, because listen, I didn't grow up in this level, but I thank my God from above that I had a mom and dad who were home, a mom and dad who read with me, a mom and dad who gave me values and talked with me and gave me an encouragement, a mom and dad who was at my ball games, a mom and dad that supported me all the way through. I am thankful and many of you can say the same thing. Amen? Amen. But there's many of our kids today who do not have it. And you say to yourself, I've raised my kids, I'm too old. No, you're not. You just think you're too old. Now, I'm not asking you to go out and do cartwheels with kids. Don't do that. That's problem, problem. Maybe not even fly a Frisbee. That'll get you in trouble too. It's about taking the time and asking those are family resource persons, how can I help a child? Yes, they need papers. Yes, they need diapers. Yes, they need whatever else. We buy underwear and socks and t-shirts. That's awesome, and I'm glad you support them. But it's only going to happen if I am building a relationship with children. Now, listen, I don't want to tout myself, but I have done that. 
with three kids in my own home, and I haven't done one of which are not a success. But thanks be to God, the others, if they had not been, their mother has been jailed multiple times. What would have happened to them? There's others. Stephen, Ms. Bacchus, has seen the same thing, and they got two beautiful girls sitting here today. How oh, beautiful. All of you girls are beautiful. They've seen a problem and stepped up and did something. What can you do? We got one back there. He's a truant officer. Lee Freeman is the best true officer there is. I don't know what his actual title is, right? Is that correct? He has to go home and work and find pieces and the level. There's never been the delinquency in his life, and he's always, yeah, he's a good man. It may do well for us to ask him, what can we do? He cannot give the names of the kids, but maybe some of the kind of interaction that we can do, getting and speaking with he and his staff, it will make a difference. I'm just challenging you to do these things. Here's what I've learned doing some statics, statistics it's in our county. There's 31,309 folk in our county. 4,696 of these live, before, live below poverty line. Powderly has 11% below poverty line of the 725. Greenville has 15% of the 4,369. Central City has 25% living below poverty. Child had no choice. They need more than paper and pencils. They need you. They need you. And my challenge is you, find a way. Now, I've quit teaching adults. Now I'm going to go to meddling. You know the reason why I quit teaching adults? Because I couldn't find adults to teach our children. Rochelle also, in her heart, is pouring him to the younger ones. Mine is, Nancy's and I's are third, three, sixth grade, and hers is younger. You want to make a difference, make a difference by coming alongside and saying, I will help teach. I will help do these things. Yeah, it's time consuming, and yes, they behave like any other child behaves. But if we don't pour in the lives of the kids, our own kids, okay, I've guilted you enough. But I love my kids. And I love kids in this county. So we can shout at the darkness and all the problems, or you can light a candle and be a light in a darkened world. I think Jesus said it best, and I like this. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of the scriptures of Matthew 5, 13, said these words. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be light bringing out God's colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you underneath a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on a hilltop and a nightstand, shine. Keep open your house. Be generous with your lives. Be open up to others. You'll prompt other people to open up with God for this is the generous Father in heaven's will for us.
God believes in you. That's why he gave you the light. I believe in you. That's why you're the light. So I want to say this morning, anyone who this day is in our school system, teaching or any other level, administrative level, would you please stand? Would you please stand? These folks need your prayers every day. Put them on your prayer list and pray that God's light will shine through them, that they can make a difference in a child's life through silent mentoring or one-on-one hugs. Shh, can't hug. They need your prayers. And you may even ask them, what can I do to help? And God's people said, God in our hearts and minds, we know what we should do. And sometimes we find it difficult. We pray for a fresh movement of your spirit. Let it be fresh wind and fresh fire among us. Help us to have actions of lighting candles. It can push back the darkness. In Christ's holy name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. Only trust him. children from six until seven we feed them at six o'clock I need cooks I need somebody who will do a grilled cheese who will put together apples who provide the meal for our kids I need helpers who's going to come alongside of Rochelle and I to help teach these kids and our children I know it's in you and I thank you for responding already amen You are a light of the world. As a light has been brought in, you are taking the light out so the world can know that God loves them. Now go in peace and may the peace of God which surpasses our understanding guard our hearts and minds until we meet again. And God's people said, Amen. amen.